I am Rachel Woody. It is May 5th, 2016, and I am here with Drinda and Mike Bayless, and we're at Ghost Hill Cellars. And so my first question for you guys is why wine? First me? Okay. Uh, <laughs> Well, uh, my story goes way back. Uh, my grandfather and great uncle bought the place in 1906, and uh, we've grown just about everything on this farm at one time or another. Uh, my kids uh, didn't really want to be farmers, so I, 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 and I've kept the place in one piece for all these years. So uh, when my uh, daughter got married to her, uh, it was in, uh, we were in, no, um, oh, senior moment here. Where was it? The bar was in Hong Kong. Hong Kong. I was talking to my then new son-in-law in Hong Kong in a bar and he said, well, how's the cattle business? Because I used to run 150 head of cattle. And I said, it stinks. And then he knew, my daughter had told him that we had thought about planting vineyard at one time and mm -hmm. that's where it came from uh, because my uh, son-in-law works for this little company you probably haven't heard of before called Exxon Mobil and actually he's the one who backs us since we farm for way too long to have any money so that's uh, and the idea of keeping the the land in the family was ex how we started. We knew we had a good hill for uh, planting, for a vineyard, and uh, that's how it began. And so I know that this piece of land has a lot of history for you and your family. Could you tell us in a little bit more detail the, the various things and, and who your ancestors are that got it started? Well, it was my... Uh, Great grandfather and great uncle. Uh, grandfather, his name was D Daniel, and uh, gee, I forgot my name. Great uncle was Samuel. That's right. And uh, they uh, bought it from the uh, owner or the the widow of the original land uh, deed. And <clears throat> my grandfather raised uh, or had cattle. Uh, dairy cattle. He had a dairy and uh, he actually when they uh, <clears throat> uh, milked the cattle he would save the milk and then he'd take it on a stern wheeler out of Lafayette and down the uh, Yam Hill River to the Willamette and then at the Willamette Falls in Oregon City he'd get off and take the train into Portland sell his milk and then come back. It took about three days to make the whole journey. Wow. And, uh, and then my father, when he, um, he raised sheep and grain and uh, he also worked in the woods. I think he actually preferred that to farming. He used to say about the place that it, the only thing it was good for was squirrels, uh, the squirrel, raising squirrels. So he wasn't, uh, it isn't the best ground in the world. And that's one of the reasons why it's good for vineyard because the vines have to struggle and the more they struggle, the better the wine. So, uh, and uh, I, I digress. We, we raised uh, beef cattle. We had 150 head at one time. We also raised hay. Uh, I actually uh, supplied some of the hay for Portland Meadows one year and um, grain and uh, eventually came to the realization, as I said earlier, that my kids didn't want to farm. It was a lot of work and we never didn't make that much money off of it, so we got into the wine business. And you had mentioned uh, before that pivotal moment in Hong Kong that you had been tempted or had thought of before about getting into the wine industry. What were some of the things that made it tempting for you? Well, I took a class in the 70s and uh, through Shemekeda and uh, I was talking to them and, and the idea, we would have, had we gotten into it at that time, we would have been pioneers in the wine industry, but my dad said no. It's, he, I didn't own the place at the time, he still did, and he said he wasn't getting into that frou-frou business of the wine industry and that was, that was it, but I knew 
from that class and from what other people had told me that it was a good location for a vineyard. And uh, I got, uh, when my son-in-law talked to me about it, I talked to Ken Wright. Because I knew, I used to work at the Trappist Abbey uh, while well, I worked full time there and farmed. So uh, I, talk, I knew Ken from the Trappist Abbey since they have a wine warehouse over there. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I asked Ken to come out and look at the, the hill that I was thinking about planting. And we walked up on our hill and we looked around and kicked the dirt around and came back down. And we set the driveway in front of the house out here. And I asked Ken what he thought. And he didn't say anything for about a minute or two. And he then finally said, how much do you want for it? So I figured that was a very good recommendation. And uh, that's uh, kind of where I really got the bug to, you know, that we were on the right path. Mm -hmm. This was, uh, and since Ken now, well, he doesn't own it anymore, but he did own the vineyard right on the other side of our fence. Uh, I think he really did think it was a nice piece of ground. Yeah, that's an excellent showing, I would think. Mm -hmm. And then if he couldn't buy your property, he definitely bought as close as he could. That's right. Uh, what year was that about? Well, we, let's see. When he looked at it, it probably would have been in uh, 90, 1998. Because okay. we started to plant in 90, 1999, finished in 2000, our first four acres. And then about two years later, he bought the property on the other side of the fence from us. Mm. Which was Abbott's claim. Oh, okay. So, Drinda, from your perspective, what were your thoughts? Were you tempted as well? And then when you guys went ahead and went for it, were you like, yes, let's do it? Or were you like, let's think about this? I was a little nervous, a lot nervous. Yeah. <laughs> After being in the farming business and not really making any money for so many years, I was just kind of like, hmm, I don't know about this. <laughs> but he wanted to keep it in the family, so... I was on board with it. We, we had to do whatever we could do to keep it in the business, keep the business here. Mm -hmm. So the kids wanted to, to start the vineyard, so we went to the attorney, started an LLC with our kids. Um, each one of our kids are part of the LLC. And um, so that's, we started planting vineyard. And I know, Mike, you mentioned that you had taken a class. Were there other things that you guys did to learn more about planting a vineyard? I know, obviously, you have the agricultural background. No, after my dad said no, I kind of let go of that idea for, because I couldn't afford to do it myself. I didn't even own the ground. Uh, so when we first, uh, well, we still have a vineyard manager, Buddy Beck is his name, Advanced Vineyard Systems, and he's the one who laid out the vineyard. We, I asked him which clones would be best to plant, uh, that sort of thing. So <clears throat> now my son-in-law and my daughter and myself and my uh, Drenda and my son Mike are all members of the LLC. We all have our little compartments as to what we do. I, I do the tractor work up in the vineyard and the spraying. All, anything that's done with the tractor, basically I do. And then so, uh, Buddy supplies the hand labor. And uh, Drinda's in charge. Well, I should let her talk for herself. <laughs> but then my son-in-law is in charge of the money part of it. And my, so, uh, I didn't, I, my son supplies the machinery for the farm or vineyard. So. Yeah. And then he buys all the equipment. He buys all of the equipment and fixes it all. Yeah, he maintains it. And you do? And I do the bookkeeping and the managing of all the best I can. <laughs> mm -hmm. so. And then, and as far as sales goes, we've been working on that. Yeah. We, uh, Carl is our PR guy, and my daughter's in charge of. Uh, she now they live in, they lived in Singapore for years. They just moved to Texas last year, and now she's in charge of sales for the company, and she's trying to get uh, distributors in Texas. We have a distributor in Texas. We're working on Tennessee. We have one in Alabama, Georgia, Georgia. Yeah, um, uh, 
uh, Florida, uh, not in Alabama, Georgia, um, Arizona, and Tennessee. Did you say, yeah, there, that's about it for now. Well, we've it's got some that aren't that active. We've got yeah. one guy, uh, one of our best distributors was uh, in Canada, in Calgary, Canada, but now that the dollar, their dollar's down so low, poor guy can't afford to buy any of our American wine. Mm. And we're also in, uh, oh, gee, uh, Louisiana. Oh, yes, Louisiana. Mm -hmm. That's right. So what are your more favorite aspects of now being in the wine industry and your roles and what are your least favorite? Well, I like driving the tractor. That's my that's nice and simple and I don't have to worry about sales and all of the money and I drive the tractor. That's my little office right there in the tractor and I listen to books on tape and it that's my favorite part. The least favorite part is trying to sell the wine. I guess my favorite part is um, working in the tasting room and, and um, meeting people, talking mm. to people. Mm -hmm. it's, I've met a lot of interesting people in, in the, all the years that I've been working in the tasting room and, um, have, met, and, and have some nice friendships uh, from that. So. Um, I think that's, a, that's the best part of it. Oh, Sometimes I, they're not the best uh, times, but um, most, I would say 99% of the time it's good times. So. Well, we forgot to mention our distributor in the Oregon, of course. We, we have oh, of course. Oregon, yeah, Oregon yeah. Wine Sales. Uh, they do a good job for us. Tim and Craig. They're, we are in Oregon, uh, made in Oregon, and actually, well, I don't know if that... We're in Costco at the moment, which is very nice for us. And we got a 94 on our Oregon, our Pinot Noir, Bayless Bauer Pinot Noir for 2012, which was a big <laughs> in deal. The wine it yes. actually opened, at, it didn't immediately, uh, it did drive sales up a little bit at the beginning of, when we first got the score, but after about three months, it began to really open some doors for us. So we're Good. very, uh, yeah. Positive about the future, as positive as a couple of old farmers can be about the future. Is, I mean, you know how farming is, it's always next year when it's going to, you're going to make your money next year. It didn't work so well today, but next year, yeah, you have <laughs> to have that or you, you can't do it. So you have to be optimistic if you're a farmer. That's right. Oh, yeah. So you had mentioned distributors. I'm curious from how you're running your winery, who is your main audience? Um, who do you find you're selling to or who do you want to sell to? Well, we have a primarily uh, some, somewhat, they're, they're uh, medium, they're, well, I would say they're higher end wines. That's the correct term for it. So a lot of the people that come out are uh, baby boomers like us, uh, not all, you know, or maybe a little younger, we're, we're going to make a wine this year that we hope will attract men, men, well, what's the right? millennium people, or, uh, no, that's not the right, anyway, I hope you edit that part out. But anyway. <laughs> I think it's millennials. Millennials is the right word I was looking for, thank you very much. Millennials. But, not many of them, uh, they come out, they taste, they like it, but they don't buy because it's, it's, not, it's not an expensive wine. And since we're a very small artisan winery, uh, we really can't make an in it really inexpensive wine. It just isn't, we don't own our own winery. Uh, we have the winery license, but we have uh, Eric Homaker is now our winemaker and uh, uh, Geez, come on. It did, it did. Rebecca Schuldas made our first wine until, and actually until last year. But we have a winemaker, we don't have a winery, so those are expenses that uh, if you have your own wine 
re and wine you are the winemaker that you can cut out and make an inexpensive wine mm -hmm. so we have to shoot for quality i guess is what i'm trying to say and our winemakers have done a good job so when you are planting the vineyard and you're figuring out what clones you wanted to use what varieties and clones did you decide on well, actually, we asked, as I said, we asked Buddy Beck which ones, and uh, some of the people he was hiring at the time came up with the, their picks. We have uh, primarily Pomard, four acres of that, which is a good backbone. Uh, we have 777, Vaudensville, and 114, and uh, in... Uh, 08, we planted five acres of 115. And um, they've uh, really turned out to be, we've had different, different winemakers say, we had a winemaker that was really in love with the 777. He said it was God's gift to us. And another winemaker I was talking to yesterday, I wouldn't use 777 in anything. You know, and then we had uh, a winemaker that really loved our 114 and so on. At, at the Vaudensville is really one of our favorites, but uh, it, it just depends on the winemaker, really. And it, it, as I said, Buddy Beck is, and uh, they are the ones who picked which ones to plant. Mm -hmm. And then on the 115, I asked a lot of wine makers that I knew, knew that then by then I knew winemakers and I asked them what they and they said well 115 so that we have uh, two wines that are made out of our 115 and the rest of the the other two wines are made of a combination of the other four have you ever been tempted to try different varieties what a Pinot Noir is what we do best here. I don't see any reason to stray from that. From the you know for the long term, mm. the one are the Pinot Noir is really uh, you know I mean, yes we can do some other wines well, but other please places can do those wines very well too, and Pinot Noir is what we can do as good as anybody in the world, if not better. So mm -hmm. that's what we're sticking with it. We might plant some other varieties if we grow, but there's no plans to do that at the time. How would you describe what your Pinot Noir tastes like, and how do you think your land plays a particular role in that taste? Your turn. Uh, I think our wines are um, very smooth, very elegant. Um, our winemaker describes our Bayless Bauer wine um, as a, um, a more feminine style wine and our reserve as a more masculine wine because there's more oak in the, um, the reserve than there is in the Bayless Bauer. Um, it has a nice long finish on the palate. Um, in the reserve we take the each one of the clones are aged in its own oak barrel and then blended. Um, it, it's, it's a blend that she chooses um, after tasting each one of the barrels, um, or she chose after she, um, um, to make the blend. And then on the um, Bayless Bauer, it's just, it, they're all blended together. It's basically, I think it's 50% uh, Pomard and then the rest are all blended together. Um, but again, it, it's, they're very um, smooth, nice long finish on the palate, um, um, elegant wines. Uh, the soil makes a big difference. Yes. We're on Willa Kinsey soil, uh, which is a sedimentary soil over eight, and then there's uh, rock from uh, volcanic eruptions six million years ago or so. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> then it's old ocean bottom, which is sandstone underneath. So everything pretty much is that uh, thin layer of topsoil, and then it gets into the Willie Kinsey, the loam soil. And 
uh, as I say, it, most of it's been farmed for I don't know how long, maybe around 100 years, a lot of it. And so that makes the vines struggle. And we feel that's quality. That makes quality grapes. We don't get high yields. Mm -hmm. uh, the very top of our hill was still, when the w Missoula flood happened, and only the very top of our vineyard would be above the flood water. So that would still be volcanic soil there. So, and that's what makes, we get the blackberry, black fruit flavors is what we're noted for with the Willa Kinsey soil. The, the, it's been touted as some of the best, the vineyard next to us has been touted as one of the best vineyards in the world for uh, Pinot Noir. So I don't see any reason why the, our vineyard that's right next door shouldn't be pretty dang good too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So how did you go about finding your two winemakers? Uh, serendipity, most, well, for the first one, uh, Rebecca Schuldis and I both worked at, the, I worked at the Trappist Abbey over here for about 39 years. And they had a, they had actually what it was, was a, they used to make pews, church pews. Mm. And the Catholic Church kind of went out of church pews in the 70s and started to make kind of like their churches were auditoriums. So they didn't put down permanent pews. They had folding chairs. And then so they went out of that business and made office furniture for a while. And then they finally gave up on that also. They had this huge building, a big complex that was empty. And so they came up with the uh, Father Pasco, who was the procurator at the time, which means business manager, came up with the idea, along with Su Susan Sokol Blosser, who he knew well, of making it in into a wine warehouse. And um, so I worked in the wine warehouse. I did all, well, I did all kinds of jobs at the Abbey, but one of the jobs was working in the wine warehouse and driving their delivery truck. And uh, Rebecca Schultz was hired on as the, ma uh, well, at first she was just working there and uh, in charge of their sales. So uh, I said to Rebecca one day, because our we had, did have a, a winemaker before that, and uh, he got in trouble with the uh, OLCC and couldn't make wine anymore. So I said, I, we were talking, and I said, well, I, I need a winemaker. And she said, well, I need to make wine. Because the, the, um, the license they had through the Abbey was as a winery. So there's various places they can ship to as a winery that you can't ship to if you don't have a winery license. So, so that's how it was born. And uh, she made very good wine for us. Uh, it just, uh, she was deployed a couple of years ago. She's in the Air National Guard and she was deployed. She ended up in Romania during harvest and there was nothing we could do. We needed somebody to be there for us in, during harvest. So that's when we uh, hired Eric Homaker who has bought our grapes for three years now and loves our vineyard. So that's how we got the idea to ask him because he's a very well noted winemaker. And, and now Eric's our winemaker. Was there much of a transition process from Rebecca's style to Eric's style? Where we, <clears throat> we're hoping for wines that match the wines that Rebecca made because we've gotten good scores. We have people that really love our wines. Eric's working on just not so much working, but he's, because he's a good winemaker, he's pretty much matched. Uh, the only thing he's made so far that is all his is the rosé, which pretty much makes what matches the style of rosé uh, ros that uh, Rebecca was making. It's a burgundy style of wine. Uh, all four of our wines are Pinot Noir Blanc and the Rosé and the Bayless Bauer and the Reserve are made in the style of a Burgundy wine. So French, very much French style. That's our, 
Rebecca spent a year living in France and uh, she uh, studied under Thibault at Willikinsey and he was a, he's a French winemaker. So she uh, used the French style, she was in love with the French style of making wine. Mm -hmm. uh, to back up for a moment, we've talked about the transition <coughs> a little bit going from <coughs> farming to vineyard and winery. What was that like? What does the transition look like? And what were some of the successes and challenges of going through that process? Mm -hmm. uh, it's completely different. It is farming, but it's not like I had anything I'd been used to. I mean, it's so much different from grain farming. There's still a tractor involved, but it's kind of a toy tractor compared to the tractor I had is to farm with. Yeah, we had to sell all the big equipment, the, the combine, the mm -hmm. big, the, the hay, the, the baler, the straw chopper, all the big equipment we sold. Um, and that was, that was quite a big transition to get on that little bitty toy tractor and go up there in the vineyard and work up, work up the vineyard and spray the vineyard and that kind of stuff. And, the first year we were up there, we thought we could handle the first five acres by ourselves before we hired the uh, the vineyard manager to do that stuff. And we got out there the first day and we thought, no, we can't do this ourselves. This yeah. is too much work. <laughs> so we we called Buddy up and said, mm, you can do it. <laughs> well, I tried. We tried uh, doing our own tr uh, pruning and pruning. brush pulling and leaf pulling and, and when you've got a big you know four acre vineyard it, and well nowadays I mean I tried that really later on I took another class at Chemeca and about uh, vineyard management and yeah. you look and you've got we've got 15 acres now so when you're at the bottom of the hill on one row, maybe you get to the top of the hill by that night, you know, and it's very discouraging to look out there and see about 40 more rows. So and we just about had to have a vineyard manager, but the, uh, the difference between farming for me and uh, the vineyard is there's so much more to do. We, at first, we were selling all of our grapes, mm -hmm. so, but that was a difference than you know, when we're, you're grain farming, you go take your grain into the elevator and it's gone. You know, well, you do have to sell it at a certain time, but you don't have to go find somebody that will buy it. And so I ended up having to find people that would buy our grapes. And then, uh, oh, uh, then in, in 2006, we started making our first wine. So that means means you have to find somebody that'll buy the wine also. So mm -hmm. you get into sales and quite a few other things that just, you didn't have to do when you were a farmer. You didn't have, there's a lot more, a lot more to the wine industry than there was for me in farming anyway. Mm -hmm. It's much more complicated. Complex is the right word, complex. It's much more complex. Mm -hmm. When things were overwhelming and, and hard, how did you guys get yourselves through it? Hmm, good question. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think we did because we're here. I would say so too. Yeah, we're, we're still in the business. <laughs> yes. Um, there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of heartache. There's a lot of frustration. Um, a lot of discussion, should we continue, should we, sh is it really worth it, um, you know, it's, it's, a lot, it's, it's a lot of work, it's, it's, it's not, uh, you know, they, they say the glory of, of and, and the romance of being in the wine industry, well, you know, it is work, mm -hmm. it is a lot of work, um, it just doesn't happen, it just doesn't fall in your lap. Um, but at least I can say we're still together. <laughs> um, it's, uh, it's been trying. It's been trying. Mm -hmm. um, you just have to work through it. It's just like farming, though. We had to work through that, too. We had our trying times. There was times, uh, you know, where you didn't um, have enough to pay the bills from the year before, and 
Um, but this this one's um, you know the the industry um, seems to be this is a little bit more forgiving than the farming industry was. I think uh, you, you can always um, um, pay your bills. At least we've done we've managed to pay the bills with this one. You're really painting a beautiful picture of the wine industry I here. Know. <laughs> but there's the there is the fact that this is. Uh, it is challenging, and it, it's, it really feels good when you do something right for a change. So, uh, and uh, getting your name out there and getting uh, publicity, and it's, it is kind of fun when some things are fun about it. But uh, because, you know, like I said, as I said, the thing about farming was we didn't, you know, somebody buys your grain. Nobody goes, oh, I bought Bayless's grain from the hill over there. Now it's, I bought Ghost Hill Cellars and it's so wonderful. Mm -hmm. There's a lot, that helps a lot, the recognition of doing a job and doing it well. Well, when we were farming, we were out there until, I remember farming, plowing the fields out there until midnight, Get, going to bed, getting up with the kids to get them ready for school and going out and disking and plowing the fields in the morning, the next morning, after the kids left for school. We don't do that anymore. Um, you know, I go in and sit at the desk and work at the computer and check the emails and stuff, but, um, you know, somebody else does the real manual labor for us. Um, Mike and my son do do the spraying and the working up of the vineyard, but um, um, it's, it, it just seems like it's, just so much easier than it was doing the farming. Well, how much do we, we just, uh, I'd say the fact that we want to keep, we're still want to keep the ground in the family is one of the ways we get through it. And then we've got our daughter and son-in-law and the grandkids to, that come and stay. That part of it is kind of how we get through the rough parts, I'd say. Uh, a similar question, and one we like to ask our couples who are still together. Um, <laughs> the wine industry is notorious for being hard on marriages, mm -hmm. and I imagine other agricultural areas, it's the same thing. I believe I heard you guys have been together 50 years? Uh, 50 years next year. Next year. So congratulations, and also, what's your secret? <laughs> well, don't try to do what we did. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Never start your own business when you after you retire. I I don't recommend it. it, it it's um, it's a lot of work. Is you just have to give and take. Mm. Uh, there's a lot of giving, more giving than there is taking. Um, I'd say it's my part, seventy five percent giving. <laughs> but he would say the opposite. Uh, I would just, say, you yeah, know. Yeah, I know. <laughs> well, no, I, you know, one thing, uh, people come out here and say how beautiful it is here and how, and I live here. We get to live here even though it doesn't, it, I, look, I look at that beautiful view out there and I see work. They see a beautiful view, but uh, we get to live here. Mm -hmm. And I, I don't think I'd ever be happy in the city. Mm -hmm. No, I know you wouldn't. <laughs> I know you wouldn't. And so, you know, and... You just got to put up with the other person's uh, foibles. Really? Yeah. I wish you did a better job of keeping up with mine. I... <laughs> Still love between you two, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. My husband likes to say, I wouldn't tease if I didn't love. So, I That's good you need line. to have a I sense think of I'll humor. use that from here on. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Drinda, I don't think that helped. <laughs> You know, you, it's like I say, you just have to, you have to give more than you take, and it just, it just happens. It just, um, you have to make it work. Mm. You have to keep, you have to keep trying. You can't just give up. And it has for us. I mean, we, we, believe me, we've had rough patches. And, um, but it comes around. And I'm sure the rest of them can tell you the same thing. Mm -hmm. It's not easy, but you can make it work if you want it to work. Well, thank you for sharing. Mm -hmm. 
Switching to Ghost Hill Cellars, the name and the story, there's quite a story behind it. Would you please share that with us? Uh, <clears throat> well, the road out, uh, actually it goes through our property, what uh, is Ghost, our Oak Springs Farm Road, and that's part of the original military road from Port, or well actually from the Washington border to California border. Uh, and sometime in the late 1800s, a miner camped up on the hill uh, for the night. Uh, it just, you know, wherever, it, when it got dark, that's where you camped. And during the night, he was murdered for his poke of gold. In the process, his horse was killed. And since then, he's been seen astride his horse looking for the one who took his life and his gold. Uh, we had an elderly neighbor, Colleen Williams. Uh, who uh, has since passed away. Uh, when she was a little girl, she got her older brother, Hugh Ed, to take her up on the hill to see, uh, because she'd heard the stories and she wanted to go up on the hill and see it. And she saw the rotting uh, saddle and the bones of a horse up there. Uh, and we do know other people that have come through that their grandfather or their uncle or great uncle has told them the story. So the original settlers in the area knew it as Ghost Hill. Mm -hmm. Our last sighting was about 20 years ago and uh, we personally haven't seen the ghost, no, but we're pretty sure, you know, fact-wise, that there was someone murdered up on that hill and there was gold involved. There was more gold taken out of Oregon than there was California. Mm. They had better press then, just like they do now. <laughs> Excellent tie-in. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, so for, for the label and telling the story from a marketing and selling perspective, I imagine that hooks people. Yes, it yes. does. Well, we I, have. Oh, I'm sorry. This is, oh, I just. We've had paranormal people come out. And they want to conjure up the ghost, and I said, "No, you can go home. I can't." So just leave the ghost alone. Well, I don't want the ghost going towards the light because what's Ghost Hill without a ghost? That's true. And we did. Um, <laughs> there was a one of the people that came out and tasted wine, and he said he was a professor from Southern Oregon, that um, his uh, he liked doing the history of Oregon. Mm -hmm. And he said those stories about people dying in, in, in that era were quite common. He said you have to remember that this was very um, isolated, there was open territory. Mm -hmm. um, people dying in the open areas like this was quite common and wherever you were killed, that's where your grave was. Mm -hmm. Nobody took the time to take you to a cemetery or whatever. He said that's wherever you were killed, that's where your grave was. So, and he said, you know, a lot of people don't understand that. But there's probably more people out there than you realize. Mm -hmm. Well, there was, uh, you know, in those days, this was all still forested because my grand, when my grandfather bought it, he started clearing the, the land off, but it was all forest. There were some, I don't know how much was cleared by the original landowner, but I don't think it was very much. And, uh, the uh, so it was it, finding someone after something like that happened finding the murderer would have been very difficult and the thing was that people would follow out of the gold fields they would follow somebody waiting for their chance to well take the gold and this unfortunately the man died was killed for that but the chances of the person being found who did it was and there was no police force it's not like they had you know each town had a or had a sheriff but they didn't go out and try and find something somebody that had committed a crime outside of the city limits so it was a pretty safe bet got away with it Mm -hmm. And as to why the horse was killed, we don't know, because everybody asked that. Uh, one thing is, horse was the biggest target. It was much easier to shoot a horse than it was a man. And if you shot a man's horse, then he was on foot. So I'm, that's my guess as to why the horse was killed. I and then there's a second 
ghost story if you want that too. Yes, I'd love to hear that. Uh, there was a robbery in Carlton. Carlton's only three miles from here. And there was a rob bank robbery followed by a shootout. And one of the uh, robbers was mortally wounded. And this was back in the days of horse and buggy. And he wrote, they rode out here on it, horses. And they hid in the, our field, our big field, just on the, almost on the, over by the road, apparently. This, again, was all still forest. And uh, he was, uh, I guess he couldn't ride any further. So he sent his horse on and uh, hid in the bottom of the field, and he did a good job of hiding because he'd been dead for about a month by the time they found him. And that's another reason why they started to call it Ghost Hill, mm -hmm. uh, Ghost Hill, which I'm really lucky they did because really, really bad luck Hill would be not that good a name for a winery, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Uh, your tasting room also has some story behind it, uh, especially from the materials that you have used. Could you tell us about that? Uh, well, <clears throat> excuse me. Again, I worked at the Abbey for 39 years, and uh, they built a new chapel at the Abbey, so I got to get, I uh, got some of the glass from the chapel that was uh, handmade glass that was made about 70 years ago. Uh, the uh, altar was sitting on a oak floor. I got the oak floor and refinished it and cut it down and made it into a bar. And uh, on the back, there's barn wood from our barn that I cleaned and restained and repurposed. So it's, you know, it's kind of a bunch of scrap wood all put together. And my son and my husband built it. Oh, yeah. For going a bit broader and looking towards the future, for Ghost Hill Cellars, where do you see it evolving or where do you hope that your children might take it? Well, I, the plan is to um, build a nice tasting room up on top of Ghost Hill. Mm. Um, it has a phenomenal view of the valley and um, He'll take you up there and show you the, the view that you have of, from Ghost Hill. Sit out there on the, a nice veranda, have mm -hmm. a glass of wine, some cheese and crackers. And that's, I'd like to see the kids do something like that. Um, and um, I don't, I, I don't want to see him, I don't want to see Ghost Hill really grow very much. Maybe, what, 5,000 cases? That's that? about 5,000 cases, they say, for an artisan winery is about the limit because then after that you don't have as much time to pay attention to to what's going on with the wine. The that, detail of it. We have a spot up there that you can three, see 360 degrees on the whole valley. A uh, friend of mine who knows where Mary's Peak is can spot Mary's Peak up there from up there, and that's 35 miles from here. So it's a really beautiful view. Uh, you can't go all the way up on top because it's planted to crimson clover right now, but uh, if we could put a winery up there, I'm, we're hoping that it, or not so much a winery. We were thinking about a winery originally, but now just a tasting room at least, a nice tasting room that maybe would be a destination place for people to come and, and look at the valley, look at the view. Uh, don't know when that's going to happen. That's still a plan. Uh, uh, as far as I know, my daughter and son-in-law don't plan on making it a huge business, staying small, doing uh, our high-quality wine. And, and that's kind of the future. We have 90 acres of plantable, uh, well, that would, could be planted to Pinot Noir. You can plant some sort of grape almost anywhere, but Pinot Noir ground, we have 90 acres of it, so uh, we'll see what happens. I don't know. We probably won't see what happens in the future, but uh, maybe you will, so. And is it something that you hope future generations will continue to have a tie to this land? I hope so. That's what we were, we were just mentioning that today, yes. If we do, 
That's what the hope is, that they, our ghost hill sellers will still be around uh, and for future generations to be able to uh, appreciate uh, the land and living here. Hopefully they'll continue the, the efforts that we've made to um, keep it in the family and keep it growing like it is. And for Oregon wine, where do you see the industry evolving? We don't, uh, I don't, my crystal ball is broken. <laughs> I have no idea. We Things get are that changing a lot. so fast, it's very hard to tell where it's going to go. I hope the quality stays up. At this point, it looks like it will. That's my main worry that we will have too many people come in and start dropping the prices and the quality of the wine. Since Oregon is known for quality Pinot Noir, uh, we're, we're praying that that's what the future will be too. Uh, at this time, it looks like there's a lot of money coming into the area, but they're keeping the quality up. So we're hoping that that stays that way. Mm -hmm. But who knows? Well, there isn't any other place in this in the state of Oregon that can grow Pinot Noir like we can in this area. Um, you know, they can grow Pinot Noir, but it doesn't have the same quality as we do. Um, so let's let's hope it stays that way. Well, they can grow very good wine in France and call it Burgundy, and but they can't grow a Yam Hill Carlton Pinot Noir here. So, and it there is. Luckily for us, there's not one palate that says, oh, that's the best wine there is. Uh, our wine's very good, theirs is very good, and as far as the rest, you know, then down in the Russian River in California, they grow some very good Pinot Noir there too, so. But it's one of the best places in the world to grow Pinot Noir, and we hope that quality stays. Mm -hmm. Since you have been in both the farming community and the wine community. Could you describe some of the differences and similarities between the two communities? Well, they sort of get along like oil and water. Uh, yeah, it, they're different because, you know, it's just that, as I described earlier, farming's a lot different than growing grapes and having people come out here from the city and well, the first thing that comes to mind is that they're, um, the people in the wine industry aren't original to the area. <laughs> and the first thing you hear is like, go home, don't come back. <laughs> Everybody around in this area, I mean, we're the, we're the only ones here that are original farmers that still are, are on the property that we're farming to begin with. Um, the rest of them are all transplants from other places, other states, and never been in the farming industry and don't know what it's like. I mean, this Bayless Road, when, when Mike and I first got married, nobody knew Bayless Road. Um, I remember his parents if a car drove by on this road, they went to the window to see who it was because nobody drove by on the road. Now, it's like there's 20, 30 cars a day go by. Um, there's just so many cars that go by. Um, and they're all either, well, now we have the Filbert industry starting to grow um, and then the wine industry growing. Hazelnut industry. Hazelnut industry. Uh, from the old school, it's Filberts, mm -hmm. and um, it, it, it's just, um, the area's changed so much. Um, it's just, uh, yeah, they're, they're, if you talk to the old timers, they aren't real happy with the wine industry because they've taken so much of the, of, um, out, of the out of the farming community and, and and planted it into grapes, which a lot of people, uh, the old farmers, don't like. Well, there is the 
the feeling of having roots to the land and the yeah. people that come in really, not all, there's certainly people here that have feel like they have roots here too, but some of the, well, some of the newer money coming in, I think it's just, it's a, it's a business. It's not the same as farming. When we, when we're in it, we're farming. Uh, if you have a big end, uh, industrial wine re come in, there's somebody they hire to do the, the vineyard part of it and somebody they hire to do the winemaking and somebody gets hired to do the selling. And it, it's just not the same as having your, your blood and your sweat into it yourselves, your own. Mm -hmm. And there's, uh, I think there's a lot, there's, I wouldn't want to say there's a lot of resentment, but there is some resentment of the farm uh, community for, the, you know, the winery and it's flashy and the, there's a and there's a lot of tourists come out and disturbing their farm way of life and you know and, and then there's just the things with the, on a commercial basis you have to be very careful about the sprays that they use in farming so it doesn't affect vineyards and uh, it's kind of a headache in a way for them and so. Uh, I may be wrong about this, but I still see quite a division or a division between the farming industry and the winery industry, wine industry. Mm -hmm. It must be hard, I would imagine, for you, because you, you straddle it, both the farming and the wine. Mm -hmm. Just got to watch what you say to who. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You can't be your alliances to the farming community because that's where you came from. Well, we still farm. My, I don't farm the ground myself, but my neighbor, the ex-neighbor who now has, a, but he's still in the farming business, he farms. So I'm, I have wheat growing on my property, crimson clover and Timothy hay. So we're still in the farming business. So we get, we're on both sides of the fence. So we just, uh, and we're, I guess we're just not good enough ambassadors to change anybody's mind. So uh, it's just, I think it eventually that'll be, I don't know if it'll be that important. Maybe it isn't as important as it was when the wine industry first started growing here. I think there's less resentment now. Certainly the uh, government likes it because there's a lot more tax dollars involved. Mm -hmm. yes. I was talking to a commissioner and I, they said, you know, <clears throat> when before when we needed to do something, there was never any money to do it. And now we can. Did you have anything that you wanted to add to that, Trinda? Mm -hmm. Just said just so that there, there's still, I don't know how, when this resentment, there's, a, there's resentment for the farming community from the farming community for the wine industry because of the, I think it's, there's a lot of s snootiness from the wine community. Um, hey, we're in the wine community, watch what you say. Yeah, but we're, f basically we're from the farming community. Um, it just... Um, there's not a lot of good old boys in the wine industry, no. I no. Not, not, my dad used to put on a over, or a, uh, coveralls. Co he had coveralls, but he'd put on a dress suit coat and go to town. And that wasn't the, you know, he wasn't out of place in the back in the 50s and 60s. Now you'd see somebody like that and it would be really shocking, especially if they were going into wine reason tasting. And I mean, it's just a completely different atmosphere. I, and that's not exactly the word I'm looking for either, but... A different era. Perhaps. Era. Yeah. Well, yeah. I remember when, back when I was growing up, these small farms like this, people, there were a lot more of them, the small farms. And people uh, it had everything they needed from the farm. Uh, we didn't, we'd go into town about once every two weeks. 
We had every, you know, we grew up, my mom had a large garden and canned and we had pigs and we had cows and we had sheep and uh, chickens, turkeys, you name it, we had it. If you wanted to eat it, well, it was here. You didn't have to go to town. So, and, and I remember it was, it wasn't that bad a life. There was a lot of really hard work when you had to work, but then during the winter I can remember my mom and dad going up to the neighbor and they'd play pinochle for five or six days in a row. <laughs> you do your chores in the morning, you go up to the neighbors and you play pinochle and then you come home at night and do the evening chores and get up tomorrow and do the same thing. Because that was before television. We, died. we didn't have television when I was a kid either. Well, I'm very old there. <laughs> Well, for new people coming in, do you have advice for them in, in any sort of area? What would you suggest? Try to blend in a little better. Try to blend in with your neighbors. Remember, they've been here for years, and, and their heart and soul is in this land. So try to fit in a little better. Don't look at them as being beneath you. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I would, yeah, that would be my advice. That's excellent advice. Well, I have asked all the questions that we prepared. Is there anything that I've forgotten that I should have asked or anything that you want to share with us before we close? Not that I can think of. I think you touched on everything. Well, thank you for Good. taking us down and uh, our letting a little bit of our lives go into this uh, documentary. We, we thank you for that. You're welcome. It's our pleasure.